On November 30th, a very important climate conference known as COP28 started, and when one considers the list of attendees, it would seem to be one of the most important events this world has seen. From the elite and the super rich to those who would be considered the rulers of this world are attending, and given how ludicrous some of the ideas are that are held by people such as Bill Gates, who wants to rid the world of all trees to help improve the climate, one wonders what the real reason for this conference is. If the very rich and the elite of the world have gathered to entertain ideas such as these, then they are certainly not serious about improving the climate, and there must then be some other reason for them to attend this conference which likely has to do with imposing more rules on the population that will allow those who pull the strings to have more control over the citizens of the world. There is much more going on here than meets the eye, and the Bible actually speaks about this year's COP28 meeting in Daniel chapter 9. When we look at the headlines regarding this conference, certain key words stand out that provide us with clues about where to look in God's word. In this headline, we see that the European Parliament wants all countries to strengthen their climate commitments. What are these commitments? In this welcoming message for this year's conference, it is explained that the world agreed in 2015 to limit global warming by taking certain actions to limit the impact that human activity has on the climate. This of course, just as the pandemic of the past three years, is based on data that is very questionable at most. And when we see how aircraft that were supposed to fly to this conference have been frozen to the runways in Germany, something that has never happened before, global warming is definitely not the issue here. The article continues to assign a specific time frame for countries and nations to achieve these goals, and that of course is seven years. So the stated goal of COP28 is for all countries to strengthen their climate commitments for the next seven years. Let us see now how God's word points to this exact understanding in Daniel 9. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel 9 verse 27 tells us that a certain person will confirm or strengthen the covenant or the contract or the commitments made with many, meaning the nations and countries of the world for one week or seven years. In the context of prophecies from Daniel that have already been fulfilled, we know that one week refers to a period of seven years, and what is written in Daniel 9 verse 27 is almost word for word describing what we read in the headlines with regards to COP28. What is further important to note is that this conference will be ending on December 12th, and for the duration of this conference this will be the only opportunity during which a seven-year commitment by all the nations of the world could be strengthened to match the description provided in Daniel 9, that will achieve a seven-year time frame to reach the outcomes of Agenda 2030. When COP28 ends, this opportunity will be over, and according to the Word of God, we know that this person, who is also referred to as the man of sin, will be made known to the world before this conference ends. According to God's word, this man will be the one who confirms the strengthening of the commitment by the nations of the world to achieve the Agenda 2030 goals. I believe the reason why this is mentioned in Daniel 9 is for those who are keeping their eyes on world events, to be in a position to identify who the Antichrist is, and this would seem to be his first public action that will reveal his identity to those who remain on the earth. God's word further explains that before he can be revealed to the world, a restraining force has to be removed. We read about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. There is only one entity in the Bible that God himself assigned the authority to prevent the man of sin from stepping forward, and this is explained to us in Matthew 16. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, 
and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So many of God's children do not know or believe that the true church of God is the restraining force that is mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. However, the enemy knows this very well and shares his knowledge with the world in plain sight in more than one instance. In what could certainly be considered one of the most prominent pieces of predictive programming, the iPetco 2 animation, we see how the enemy is showing us his understanding of who the restrainer is. Here the Antichrist figure emerges into the open and then wakes up. You will see that he has a piece of barbed wire around his head. So what could this barbed wire crown represent? Would barbed wire not be considered an object with which the Antichrist is bound or restrained? If we are unsure about whether this is the actual purpose, there is another animation in which the enemy again shows the Antichrist being restrained, and in this case proper chains are used. He is unable to step forward until he is released from these chains or restraints. This image comes from a music video by the group Disturbed. I will put a link to this video in the description below if you would like to see how the enemy sees events playing out when the Antichrist steps forward. Then the barbed wire disappears and what does the enemy associate with the removal of this restraint? As soon as the wire disappears, the church behind him begins to crumble. Showing us that from the enemy's perspective at least, the understanding is that it is the church that is holding back the man of sin. Once the Antichrist is set free, he looks at the sun in a scene that we have considered several times before. But for 2023, what is shown to us carries particular significance, just as several other world events that have matched the depiction in this animation over the past year. The sun is positioned in the constellation of Scorpio, and in 2023 the specific sunset will occur during the time of COP28, specifically around the dates of 7 and 8 December. This also lines up with the beginning of Hanukkah, where the rededication of the temple is celebrated. There are once again some differences between the different calendars when it comes to the day on which this starts. But the calendar used and recognized by Israel shows the starting date of Hanukkah falling on December 7th, which is also the 24th day of the 9th month. And the day preceding would of course be another instance of the infamous 923 or 923 that is so often featured in predictive programming. God's word has something very specific to say about the 24th day of the ninth month, and we read about this in Haggai 2. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine, and the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In this passage, the foundations of God's temple are not only associated with the 24th day of the ninth month, but also with a harvest, and that certain varieties have not produced fruit yet. God then states that from this day a blessing would be given. And where did we see this before? In Daniel 12, of course, Gabriel promises those who wait and who come to the 1335th day a blessing. We know that we are very close to the end of this period described by Gabriel in Daniel 12, and it would make sense then, especially when we consider the time frames, that the blessing that Gabriel mentioned in Daniel 12 would be related to the blessing that God promises in Haggai chapter 2. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. This is not the only correlation that we have in Matthew 24 where Jesus describes the events that follow directly after the 1335 days, which he terms the beginning of sorrows, we see how the shaking of heaven and earth is mentioned. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, 
and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Can you see how the blessing that is promised by God in Haggai 2 and by Gabriel in Daniel 12 could both be connected to the 24th day of the ninth month, which marks the beginning of Hanukkah this year? If my understanding is correct, and I could be wrong, this could also be the day on which God will shake the heavens and the earth, and where a heavenly trumpet will be sounded when our Heavenly Father sends out His angels to gather in His harvest from the earth. Coming back to the iPetco 2 animation, do you see the rings that emanate from the sun? Looking at these and considering recent space weather, these rings would seem to represent the solar storms that have been affecting the earth over the past few days. And something very interesting to note is that an earth-directed coronal mass ejection occurred exactly 45 days after the solar eclipse of October 14th. This is very significant when we consider the words of Gabriel and Jesus who explained that the end of the 1290 days mentioned in Daniel 12, serving as a time of testing for God's people or the true church, ends with a solar eclipse and 45 days later those who wait will receive a blessing. December 7th is also 40 days after the lunar eclipse that occurred on October 28th 29th and the lunar eclipse being associated with the beginning of the day of the Lord. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. From a secular perspective, we have been told that this solar storm is expected to affect GPS functionality, radio signals and internet communications, which in my opinion could play a big role in the planned collapse of the stock market and banking sector, especially if communication between banks is interrupted for an extended time and the real cause for the problem attributed to something man-made but blamed on the sun. All right, so scientists, some, are sounding the alarm on a so-called solar superstorm that could, and this is important, underline the word could, eventually wipe out the internet for weeks or even months. The sun is entering a more active time where it tends to flare more often. After those flares, large blobs, for lack of a better word, of plasma enter space and can distort the Earth's magnetic field, the power grid, satellites, navigation and GPS systems and communications equipment are all vulnerable. These solar flares would definitely seem to play a role in the enemy's plan since they also feature on the cover of An Economist magazine where the next catastrophe is discussed and how to prepare for it. This cover was featured in June of 2020 and it is interesting to consider what we are shown here. The first aspect that stands out is that a child is shown without protection against some pathogen that does not affect adults or animals. In China it is reported that many children are now being affected by a pneumonia-like disease and unlike the previous pandemic, where people were told to panic over an illusion, the message now is not to panic and that this is perfectly normal. From past experience, when it comes to these matters, we should know by now that the media would usually not share the truth with the public and that deception should be expected. We also see how the iPad Go 2 animation shows a child being affected and in this case, it is not due to illness but a war. And I believe that war is currently raging between Israel and Hamas. There have been many children caught in the crossfire in this war and that would certainly match what we see in this image. In the background, we also see what could be considered a nuclear explosion when these events are taking place. And this is once again repeated on the cover of The Economist magazine where something like a nuclear explosion would seem to be positioned in proximity to the image with the solar flare. There is also an image of a looming asteroid impact which could easily be confused with a massive nuclear explosion when it hits the Earth. And this would also seem to be shown in the iPetco 2 animation. When one combines all these events, where you have solar storms affecting the Earth, asteroids hitting the Earth, and something like nuclear explosions occurring on the Earth, there would be several reasons to believe that these have an effect on global communications and where people would for a time be cut off from everything and anything that relies on electronics. From what we are shown in this scene of the iPad Code 2 animation, this would certainly be a consideration that could contribute to markets plunging 
and banks using their customers' money to rescue themselves. We are living in very prophetic times and I believe it is very important to keep an eye on events happening at the COP28 conference. Based on what we read in God's word, the Antichrist has to be revealed before December 12th, but December 7th or 8th would be of special interest given what God's word has to say about the 24th day of the 9th month. I hope this will encourage you as this is only a few days away from the time of this video's posting. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. How do you make sure that you are ready for Jesus when he comes? We have to obtain salvation, and how to obtain it is explained in Romans 10. That, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This is the first step, and this makes you part of God's faith harvest. Once you are saved, you also have to be baptized, not to add to your salvation, but to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and to operate through you. Without a baptism, you will not receive any gifts of the Spirit, and as a child of God, it is really important to ensure that you are baptized once you are saved. Baptism serves to equip you and to increase your effectiveness in this world when ministering to others. Then Peter said unto them, Repent! and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus paid an incredible price to save us, and Romans 12 tells us that it is our reasonable service to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God in return. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Could we simply continue in this world to live like the rest of the world once we are saved? It is certainly possible to live that way, but we know that God will separate his harvest into two groups both of which are saved or have received salvation. If we are living our lives in devotion to him, he will know us as a bridegroom knows his bride-to-be. But if we live as the world, we may hear him tell us that he never knew us, because we were never intimate with him. If our reasonable service to God is to offer our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, how could it be seen as a sacrifice if we continue to live just as the lost would live? So many comment on the videos that I make concerning salvation and that it is important to ensure that one only believes and do absolutely nothing else. It would seem that abstaining from sin to the best of our ability would in their eyes count against us as works that one would do to somehow earn part of one's salvation. This could not be further from the truth. If you are in an intimate relationship with someone, you will know that your actions can affect the other person's feelings that you are intimate with. If you say something to them that hurts them, what would you do if you want to maintain an intimate relationship with them? Would you continue your day as if nothing happened, or would you apologize and try to fix the problem? The same is true for our relationship with our Savior. He hates sin, and if we continue to sin without any care of how that makes him feel, how long will we maintain an intimate relationship with him? He even told us what to do when we sin, and we read about that in 1 John 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We all sin, but Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride, and only he can cleanse us and ensure that we are without spot or wrinkle when the doors to the marriage are opened. It is up to us to allow him to cleanse us by following his instructions as indicated. He can only wash us clean of our sins if we confess our sins to him. It is not a matter of salvation, but a matter of intimacy. 
and only those who are known by Jesus, those who are intimate with him, will be allowed into the wedding and will be considered his portion of the harvest. If you want to ensure that you are ready, please watch this video for more information. I hope this video has blessed you and I look forward to seeing all my brothers and sisters in the clouds really soon. I certainly cannot wait and I am really excited to discover what our bridegroom had prepared for us. Until next time or until we meet in the air, God bless.